Thank you, Jean. Uh, so I was told that this conference, uh, there was some biology involved. So uh, I really wanted to take some time to uh, talk about the biology aspect of the project since Jérôme talk and Gabriel talk about the player aspect and everyone who participated and all these numbers are really important. But ultimately, when we design, okay, that works. When we design a science discovery games, uh, we're really building a contract with the players because their participation is conditioned on the idea that they're helping science, right? So ourselves as the scientists, we have to make sure that this science actually works. Otherwise, we're kind of tricking them. Well, we have to at least try. And so, uh, uh, yeah, so just to come back on the idea of these crowdsource sequence alignments, the core idea we're working with is that when we work with sequences we know very little about, we're going to struggle to get really high quality alignments from standard algorithms just because it's very hard to parameterize them due to the absence of a ground truth we would have of a perfect uh, sequence alignment for this type of data. So this leads us to the data we have to work with. So uh, from these stool samples from about 25,000 participants, we have uh, about 75 elements of information collected. And that's health information, like whether they have different disorders like irritable bowel or cancer or diabetes. We have some behavior information, like how often they brush their teeth, exercise, and we have food and alcohol information. So we know a lot of things about the people who donated these samples that we sequenced genomic sequences from. And so more precisely, the data we have is the first 150 nucleotides of the V4 region of the 16S ribosomal RNA, which goes from roughly this loop here, all the way in the yellow regions, up to the start in bold of this stem here. Oh, you don't see the mouse. Okay. Uh, well, it's basically it's the yellow. It's the yellow region, the first half roughly that we were working with. Um, and the task that we have is to align these sequences and eventually see if there's something we can do to try to infer back some of the information we have about the authors of these samples. Because once again, this is a microbiome study, which means that the diversity and the specific composition of the microbiome of these stool donors is going to play a role in their health. Okay, this brings the very difficult question of what exactly is a good alignment? Because once again, we don't have a ground truth for this data. We have some references. We have, al we have alignments for the 16S ribosomal RNA. We have from the Green Genes database, we have from the RFAM database, we have uh, some from the comparative RNA website, but uh, these are somewhat different and it's not obvious to tell which one is the best. However, we do have some pointers. We know some things about what makes a good alignment. For example, we know a good alignment has a high sum of pair score. Usually we know it will tend to resemble state-of-the-art alignments we have for this region. We know that it can be used to infer phylogenies that will resemble state-of-the-art for phylogenies for this type of data. And ideally, it would improve our ability to make predictions about host health or behavior uh, from these estimated phylogenies. So really, the rest of this talk, I will focus on trying to investigate these characteristics quantitatively, which for some is easier than others. The easiest one to investigate is the sum of pairs score because that we have it directly, we compute it. And what we look at is we look at five benchmarks. So the first three are just state of the art alignment methods. So uh, PASTA, which is designed for large alignments, muscle and MAFT. And then we have some specific validations. So borderline science alignments are built from pasta alignment. So we align the sequences with pasta, and then we slice puzzles out of these pasta alignments, and we have humans improve these pasta alignments by realigning regions of them. So one of our benchmarks is pasta with borderline science, or BLS, post-processing. And in that, all we do is we assume that every single player solution agrees with pasta. So that tells us how PASTA would look if everyone just agreed with it. 
On the other hand, we have these greedy algorithms that we can use to mimic the behavior of players. And that tells us how the results would look like if all the players played similarly. So basically, it helps us compare uh, between a very basic human-like behavior, very, very, very basic, versus the actual diversity of real humans playing the game. So really, at this point, we see that aside from muscle and somewhat pasta, all the benchmarks seem to have reasonable sum of pair scores. And so far, even though it's not a vast difference and it's not on its own going to confirm the alignment is the best, we can say that more than science alignments, that seems to have a reasonably high sum of pair score. The next question is to ask ourselves whether the state-of-the-art alignments uh, that I mentioned look like what we have from these benchmarks and from borderland science. And uh, okay, sorry, did I miss a slide? Okay, no, it's fine. Sorry. So uh, in specific, the, the V4 region of the 16S RNA we are working with is very strongly structured. Here on the right, we have uh, in the blue and green, and also in red, basically the squares and the circles represent respectively RNA protein contacts and uh, RNA RNA contacts. So as we can see, uh, there's a lot of contacts and the structure is quite important. And when we look at these state-of-the-art alignments for this region, such as from the Green Genes database or RFAM, or the comparative RNA website, what we see is very few indels. So overall, when we look at uh, an alignment of, say, uh, 10,000 cluster representatives of our 1 million database, and we try to align them, we expect that a good alignment would not have 800 columns that are mostly gaps. Uh, that would be a sign that there's something that's being missed by uh, an alignment method on standard parameters, for instance. And here, what we see is that um, some of our benchmarks, so PASTA, PASTA with post-processing from Borderland Science, greedy algorithm, Borderlands, have very narrow alignments for these sequences, but muscle and MAFT kind of struggle and they end up very wide, which that would tend to indicate that they are not very similar to the state of the art elements groups in general. Uh, there's something we can look into a little bit deeper, uh, which is an, uh, an agreement with a structural model. So because the structure for this region is very strongly defined, we have access to models, uh, well, statistical models that tells us the expectations for each nucleotide at each position of the structure. So this may not be super clear, but on the picture on the left, well, that's your left, my left, your right. Uh, you see that uh, the nucleotides along the V4 regions are colored. And basically this color is, uh, we looked at for each position, when there was a disagreement between borderline science and the PASTA alignment, which one of the two was closer to the nucleotide we'd expect to see at this position in the structure, according to what we know about uh, this structured region. And what we observe is that for most of these positions, the borderland science alignment is closer to uh, the model we're looking at, especially around the stem in the middle, which we know is quite important functionally because it interacts with the uh, some important proteins, namely S8, if I remember correctly. So what we see here is that we can say that when we look at the difference between PASTA and borderline science, and this difference is defined by how the players annotate the alignments, uh, the changes added by the human players tend to be closer to the structural reality for this structured region. So at this point, we're quite confident saying that the borderline science alignment at least resembles the state of the art alignments we have for the microbial 16S RNA. This leads us to the third point we wanted to look at, which is the phylogeny part. And uh, sorry, one second, is this slide coming? Okay, here we go. 
So uh, when we look at uh, microbe 16S uh, phylogeny, uh, a good database is green genes, which has a phylogeny with 300,000 ribosomal RNAs, and they have large alignments of this region. And if we want to work with new sequences to add them to this information, we can use SEP. So SEP is a software that takes as input the backbone tree and an alignment, and then some input sequences, and it uses the information from this backbone tree to insert each input sequence at the best place in the phylogeny. So basically, the better your information is before you use SEP, the better the output will be. So when we use SEP with this phylogeny with 300,000 ribosomal RNAs, and we place in, say, 10,000 new cluster representatives, we're quite confident that the output is a pretty reasonable phylogenetic organization of these 10,000 cluster representatives from borderland sites. So this is our reference for phylogeny. It's basically green genes with how borderland science manages to build alignments that can be used to infer strong phylogenies. What we can do is for each of our algorithm uh, alignments, so borderland science and then our five benchmarks, we can use fast to infer a phylogeny and then measure some distance between this phylogeny we infer and the one from green genes plus set. And for this, we use two distance metrics. One of them is a kennel called in distance, which compares placement of lower common ancestor from each pair of tips, and triplet distance, which counts the number of root trees of tree leaves occurring in one tree but not the other. These two methods are useful for comparing trees that are a little bit too different for things like prevention and false distances to work well. And what we observe is that for both distances, borderland science is significantly less distant from this reference phylogeny than all alternatives. So once again, uh, for the third point, we can say that we're quite confident about the fact that our borderland science alignments can be used to infer phylogenies that resemble the state of the art. Finally, that leads us to our last point, which is somewhat uh, harder to talk about, which is the uh, improvement or ability to make predictions about information from the person who donated the sample based on the composition and diversity of the gut microbiome sequences, sequences we found in the stool sample. Sorry, the... Okay, here we go. So, um, this slide is not changing on the screen. Sorry? Yeah, it changed on my screen. Oh, wait. Okay, here we go, that works. So, uh, when we want to compare these microbial diversity profiles, we can use uh, something called Unifrac. So Unifrac or unique fraction metric, it measures the distance between sets of taxa in a tree. So for example, if we look at the example on my left here, uh, we have two communities. So one community is the red square and one is the green circle. And in the similar community example, you see that the red square and the green circle uh, taxa are found in a very, well, close proximity in different parts of the phylogenetic tree. However, in a very different pair of community, you see that the red square and the green circle are very distant in terms of the, the branch length that we have to cover to go from an average red square and an average green circle. So really what UNIFRAC is measuring is how distant the two communities are in this phylogeny. And this is why having a phylogeny is important to draw a conclusion about these diversity comparisons, because we estimate how diverse something is based on how we estimate its phylogeny. So this means we're able to look at effect sizes, which help us quantify differences among sample groups. So when we have a phylogeny and abundance data uh, with these user surveys, so for each 
stool sample, we have the abundance of each uh, RNA we found, plus these 75 points of information about what they eat and what illnesses they have, we can uh, quantify how well each phylogeny separates samples with different data. For example, how well order than science phylogeny will separate uh, a sample from a young person versus an old person, male versus female, et cetera, and try to make uh, draw conclusions rather about which of these phylogenies are better at ident identifying differences uh, that could be important between samples. For example, there's a direct medical application to being able to separate a healthy sample from a non-healthy sample for something like diabetes, because that has direct application to say diagnostics. So we measured effect sizes for 75 non-technical variables. So from types of plants eaten to age category to frequency of drinking. And then we compared results between borderland science and our state-of-the-art benchmark, which is SEP plus green genes. And this is what we see. So um, the, the plot here shows uh, about 75 columns. And it shows the delta effect size for each variable between borderland science and SEP. So each column is an effect size for one variable. For example, the long positive blue one is for the teeth brushing frequency of the person associated with the sample. So we see that uh, borderland science improves effect sizes over SEP for most of the columns, so most of the variables. Even though there are variables, it doesn't improve over set on namely age category. And when we look at the, the improvements that are the strongest, the variables are teeth brushing frequency, alcohol frequency, diabetes, the number of types of plants consumed, and antibiotic history. And all of these variables have been linked to human digestive health. So what this tells us is that there is information in the phylogeny we get from Google and Science Alignments that is not available in current state-of-the-art phylogenetic trees for this type of data. And that satisfies our fourth condition to call something a high-quality alignment. So at this point, we have uh, been able to confirm uh, the four characteristics that we determine of what would be a good alignment. And we're quite confident in concluding that borderland science players do create high quality alignment and that the time spent by the players is not wasted. And we can say with confidence that they are actually helping science by playing the game. Uh, as Gabriel said just before, there's a big difference in timelines between science and gaming. So we just started publishing papers about this. Uh, we may have uh, three or four papers coming out in 2023 on the topic of the game, three years after the release, because it turns out that when four million people play citizen science games, it makes a lot of data that then we have to analyze. And just something as simple as having the hardware to manage these data sets becomes very non-trivial when there's 120 million solutions. So that's pretty much where we are, and you can expect more papers from us soon. So this is a really good question. Right now, we're uh, crediting the Berlin Science Players as a group because uh, the scientific team doesn't have access to any information about the participants because, you know, since the game is a virtual character playing on a virtual arcade booth, it's difficult to have a virtual ethics form to sign to allow your virtual personal information to be communicated. So to simplify this, we just completely cut our access to this information and we only get the solution. So basically we know how many people played. We know that someone played for something like uh, 600 hours, but we don't know who it is. So if they're in the room, thank you, <laughs> but <laughs> we can't thank them personally. Short. It seems that like 150 
It's 150 nucleotides, yes. So I, I know there are yeah, a lot of samples, a lot of things in the micro different organisms in the microbiome do that. But to to what like what is the like on average what is the like the That's a great question because that's one of the huge differences between Philo, the previous game in Borderlands Science. In Philo, we had relatively few players playing big alignments, and we had to kind of assume that since this player improved the sum of pairs of this alignment region, we changed the alignment based on the input from the player. In Borderlands Science, we have 50 people play the same puzzle, and then we look at the consensus between players and uh, not the consensus of all solutions, this is the consensus of filtered solutions based on how well they optimize the bioobjective function of minimizing the number of gaps and maximizing the number of matches. So basically, we have 50 solutions. We filter out about 20 of them. And then we look at the consensus, so the, the common points of the solution of the 30 others. And that helps us get a uh, how would I put this, a, uh, a solution that is more representative of the wisdom, wisdom of the crowd rather than an improvement that is step by step, one person, one task. Are those windows sliding? Like, yes. Okay. yes, we uh, we have a pretty good coverage with uh, 120 million puzzle solutions. We divide by 50, it's still a lot of puzzles. Okay. 